You know, guys, what I love more than a stock market rally at the end of the year is a stock and bond market rally. We've had huge moves in both the stock market and the bond market. I'm calling it the stock market bond market party here at the end of the year. Doesn't get better than that. Sounds like you want to party like it's 1999, right? Hey, Chris is always partying like it's 1999, you know, <laughs> on that yacht with his uh, Ferrari. And actually, that's, that's Chris's dream life, not his real life. You know, Ryan, I don't think I really like your boating analogies. Um, yeah, it's funny. Like, I've been talking to a lot of my clients and, uh, you know, of course, they, they, they've been not real happy with the volatility throughout the year, especially with their bond portfolios. And, uh, you know, one of the things I pointed out is that you know, we bought a lot of bonds with a lot of really good yields and that the secondary best part about that is the fact that if interest rates do come down, those bonds become more valuable. Well, that just goes to show you guys when you invest based on data, not on emotions, right? Now, the data shows that we just had the best quarter ever in the history of the country in third quarter earnings. They were the record high in earnings and the estimates show even higher earnings for next year. And we're still below, you know, the all time record highs that were set almost two years ago yeah. in the market. So, you know, and then you look at U.S. household net worth, $154 trillion, half of which is owned by the baby boomers. So, you know, as a, as a baby boomer, my advice to all you young listeners is, in the words of Star Trek, live long and prosper, right? The longer you live, the better your money compounds, the wealthier you'll be. Actually, you really make a good point there, Bob, because the one thing is, it's kind of funny, is like people feel like they've been caught off guard here with the fact that now the Fed is looking to maybe transition from raising rates to lowering rates. And inflation has been coming down at a pretty healthy clip, but that's the way it's been now for the last year. And if you look down into the future, the forecasting data was telling us that, well, inflation is going to continue to come down, yet everybody's shocked. And the same thing with earnings, right? The, the consensus analyst earnings estimates have been double digits for next year for a long time. But all of a sudden, people are like, whoa, <laughs> I didn't realize that was the case. And it's you know, the data has been out there. It's been hiding in plain sight, as you like to say. What I think the big problem is you got Jerome Powell and the Federal Reserve, you know, keep telling you that they're going to keep rates higher for longer. And, you know, and I think most investors and, and a lot of you probably don't understand that the Fed is a lead, not a leading indicator, it's a lagging indicator, right? It's following the data. It's always late to the party. Most often they're wrong. But I got to give, uh, you know, Powell some kudos here. He did a great job of communicating what he's doing. And meanwhile, if you're looking at the data, we're having that immaculate disinflation, you know, that we've been talking about and prices are coming down. Inflation is transitory, as it turns out. Dad, what I think what you're saying is that uh, pal's a pal. <laughs> I like that, Chris. Chris, Chris is getting more <laughs> clever in his uh, in his mid mid 40s. No, I've um, had coffee already, so we're good. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but it is it is interesting, right? I mean, if you look at um Essentially, like the amount of people just still sitting in cash, still waiting around. There's something like $5.8 trillion is sitting in cash right now. If you look at money managers, they've had some of their lowest allocations to stocks in a very, very long time. It's like everyone's waiting for that shoe to drop. And meantime, you know, again, like inflation has just been, it's been a phenomenal drop in inflation. And it's just like everyone's suddenly in shock here for some reason. I don't get it. You know, the stock market's like the greatest magician of all time. It uses sleight of hand. You know, it says over here, everything sucks, but over here is where all the deals are. <laughs> now, that's a good point, Chris. You know, and, it, and when you look at the economy, it's been extremely resilient. Um, we're having a high tech revolution, right? You're having an artificial intelligence, combine that with quantum computing. There was a great segment on 60 Minutes Sunday night that if you didn't see, you should all catch. So you're going to have productivity increase you know, over the next couple of years, which leads to higher wages without inflation, right? You have better profit margins. Earnings are going to go up, which drive stock prices. How can you not be bullish? I mean, what's wrong with these people? Well, you know what? I think here's the problem too. And I think in all fairness, right, we've all seen prices go up astronomically uh, over the course of the last two years or so. And, you know, the argument is, well, sure, inflation's slowing down, but the prices are still high. And I think that's still a problem. I think people are feeling the pinch right now, so to speak. But, you know, I think the, the difference is, are people feeling the pinch where they stop spending? Or are they just complaining about it and still spending? And I think the latter here is what's going on. It's like, oh, man, prices are terrible, yet they're still spending money. And I think that's driven solely by the fact that the labor market is really strong. You know, people are seeing their wages go up, maybe just slightly over inflation, so it doesn't feel that great. But it's enough to drive people to continue to spend. And that's what drives the U.S. economy. So we can talk about how horrible prices are and we can talk about how inflation is so much higher. But the real question is, is the consumer going to continue to spend? 
And based on the labor market being as tight as it is, most likely they are going to continue to spend and that's going to keep economic growth going. Well, I can answer that question, Ryan. Uh, Americans have record spending right now, right? We're at all time record high on, you know, especially services, you know, things like health care and food services, and air transportation, Taylor Swift concerts. I mean, it's, uh, you know, all time record highs in spending. And, you know, the thing is, there's a lot of income that's being generated now from bond portfolios, from, you know, people that own investment properties are getting, you know, record high in rents. Uh, so there's income coming in for people of means. And, you know, so it's not, they're, you know, baby boomers are retiring in droves. And yeah, you know, hey, they're going to leave some money to the next generation. But meanwhile, they're enjoying their lives. And there's, and there's a lot of sources of income and real personal income and wages and salaries you know, combined. Well, Ryan's depending on that inheritance. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you he I was going to make the same joke. <laughs> you know, what Byron Reed taught me, he said, if you never retire, you never die. But, you know, then he, <laughs> then he turned around and died on me. So now, you know, I got to come up with a new uh, mentor. But no, no, it's a great point, right? The, the baby boomers do have money. Uh, we know baby boomers like to spend. You know, Bob is probably the, a microcosm of, you know, wanting to live that good life that those baby boomers really enjoy. And that's going to be a big driver of the U.S. economy moving forward. Um, along with what you just said about productivity growth is going to go up. That's that's going to be a huge, huge catalyst. So there's a lot of things to be optimistic about. Um, and I think, you know, that's what's not being talked about right now enough is the fact that maybe people are saving a little bit less, but a lot of baby boomers don't have to save. They've already saved. Now they're going to spend their assets. Well, you know what, Ryan? All the baby boomers I know spend an extraordinary amount of money. I've never seen a baby <laughs> boomer have a problem spending a dollar. Well, you know, you and the economy, thank you're welcome. You know, yeah, yeah, we're, it's our pleasure. Um, but you know, we have the, uh, we have the Fe federal open mouth committee next week, guys. And, uh, what do you think? Do you think another pause? Do you think they might even start talking about thinking about even thinking about cutting rates now? I think you'll still talk tough. That's what Jay Powell likes to do. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But I think, look, the writing's on the wall. We went from talking about, is the fed going to hike again to now the question is how many times are they going to cut next year? Which kind of goes back to one of our main thesis that we've talked about for a long time. Uh, this year. And that's just the fact that your reinvestment risk sitting in cash is a big problem. In fact, it's like $5.8 trillion sitting in cash right now. It's a record high because people love getting that 5%, but the market's telling you they're going to cut rates next year, which means that 5% goes down quickly. We've talked about this for a long time. And meanwhile, look, the stock market has been a better place to be this year. And even the bond market's starting to shape up to be a better place to be this year. So sitting in cash hasn't been the winning strategy. And moving forward, my guess is it's still not going to be the winning strategy. Well, I think that is it's definitely becoming a big problem, especially, you know, our clients got their October statements for October. I think we can all agree wasn't a great month, but literally a day later on November 1st, things just absolutely took off. And to your point, Ryan, it happens at the drop of a dime. I mean, you're sitting in cash, you know, you're not, you're not getting invested. I mean, you're going to completely miss the boat. Well, you know, here's the thing that I don't think most people understand. I've had, I, um, one of our podcast listeners called up and said, you know, the s and up 20%, Bob. Should I put everything in the S&P? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's great. It's up 20% this year. It was down 20% last year. So you've got a zero return. Um, meanwhile, I think this is something that no one's really noticed, but the, the value portion of the S&P hit an all-time record high this week. And that whole argument that this whole stock market's predicated on seven companies going higher than mega cap seven. Well, that's not true, right? I mean, look at it this year. Now we've seen our pipeline, energy pipelines have had a tremendous move over the last couple of months. Uh, foreign stocks are up 11, 12% this year. And we actually like the foreign markets like probably no one else in the world. Small caps have had a huge move now. They're getting it to be close to up 10%. And Bob, you mentioned this earlier too. If you take an equal weight S&P 500, that dilutes the impact of those mega cap seven stocks. Well, that's up eight, 9% with dividends this year now. So the rally is definitely broadening out. There's lots of opportunity to put your money in a lot of different places. You don't have to sock your money into the S&P 500. Probably not the best idea for all your money because it's so concentrated in seven companies. And you never want your portfolio predicated on what seven companies do. It can be really good if they're going up, but those stocks are going down. Man, oh man, no fun. Now, I'll tell you what, guys, this shows the impact that interest rates have on all financial assets, um, like a big seesaw, right? When rates are going up, everything's going down. But when rates are coming down, Everything's going up. So, you know, the seesaw is moving in the right direction. Um, we're a couple of percent down from the all time record high. We may even hit that before year end, but it looks like a certainty first quarter 2024. Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 142 Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, 
can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you have saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will put together our total financial master plan and we'll do that no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review to show you how to make sure you're on your path to financial independence. We're literally gonna build you your own personalized financial portal. We're gonna give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life. And we're gonna hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether that income plan for retirement. How do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio without running out of money and doing it optimally, factoring in inflation? We'll put together a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Markets have been extremely volatile the last two years. I don't need to tell you. Has your portfolio been like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We're gonna put together a full investment game plan. We're gonna tie it to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we're gonna look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products. If it's an annuity, a mutual fund, brokerage product, structured product, insurance product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you where all the hidden costs are, show you how to reduce that cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. Literally go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Bob and Chris, as we know, Bob has been going to the gym religiously since he's got back to Naples, Florida. Um, you should see his guns now. You can't really see it <laughs> through the podcast, unfortunately. But it got me thinking that a lot of being a financial planner um, and getting financial advice or working with a financial professional, as we would say, is kind of like having your own personal trainer for your health, but instead for your financial health. Well, you know what, guys? Um, I did go to the trainer yesterday morning, and I am feeling it today because, you know, they, they focus on muscles that you would never, ever work with because you don't like working with those muscles. It's painful. <laughs> and uh, you definitely pay the price the next day. And that's the whole idea, right? When you're thinking, oh, maybe I won't be able to retire comfortably. Maybe I don't have the right strategy. Maybe I'm not saving enough. Maybe I'm spending too much. It's painful to do a budget. And you know what? You just keep procrastinating just like you do with your fitness. So it's really important to work with a trainer and to have a financial trainer to make sure you're making those hard decisions. Well, like case in point right now, you know, Ryan always says the obvious trade's the wrong trade. You know, everybody wants to go and buy those short-term money markets or short-term bonds. But the right thing to do is to buy something a little bit more long-term or invest that cash in the market while it's low. It's sort of like a, a th the opposite of what you think you should do. Wait a minute, Chris, well, you're thinking... You're thinking a 5% annual return on cash is better than a 7% return on stocks in one month? I mean, come on. How does that work? <laughs> you just got to pick the right month. That's the problem. That's but I think it problem. goes back to our personal training analogy is it's not about instant gratification, right? Really, investing is never about instant gratification, unfortunately. And that's why it's hard because it's like you want to put your money in when markets are higher. Everybody's putting their money in. It seems easy. And then what happens is typically the market goes down for a while and makes you feel some pain before you actually reap any of the benefits. So I think it's the same thing. It's like you have to start thinking about the long game when you get invested because you know when you work with a trainer or you go to the gym, you're not going to be buff after the first two weeks, right? Maybe after a year, two years, but it's kind of the same thing when it comes to your financial plan. Well, just like fitness is, you're, you know, you're, you're working on a long-term plan of living longer and healthier. Um and same thing with your investment strategy it should be based on a goal, your personal goals. It's not about should I buy Bitcoin or should I, you know, should I own NVIDIA? Should I short, you know, the uh, the Bitcoin market or whatever? It's, it's all about, you know, investing in, in strategies that will give you the returns that you need. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's really kind of a different construct, a different way of thinking. And to me, it's more logical. You know, when you have an investment strategy based with an end in, in mind, right? It's like planning a trip, yeah. um, you know, knowing how to get to the destination and knowing, you know, that there are going to be some, um, you know, pit holes, pot holes along the way. But, um, you know, it's all about planning. Well, it's true, right? You don't go to the gym and just start doing pushups aimlessly <laughs> because, hey, <laughs> this will make me feel good and I'm going to be stronger in a couple months, right? You probably have a, an end in mind of like, hey, I want to lose 10 pounds or 15 pounds. I, I want to... I won't have biceps, I know, whatever happens. I know Chris is always dreaming of having biceps, 
but you know the point is right you want to you want to reconstruct backwards you have to really start thinking about like where you want to go to and i had someone email me the other week saying hey ryan i know you guys do financial planning and your financial advisors which i don't know what the difference between that is by the way um but you know i really just want someone to tell me how to diversify i don't really want to do a financial planning review and I'm like, well, you really can't do one without the other. It's impo- you're going in blind if you're just like buying financial products and diversifying, but you have no idea what your goals are. And that's literally what our industry does. And that's how most portfolios look. And that never works out that well. Well, you know, it's a lot like those uh, those Oxycontin pill mills down in Florida. You know, they they didn't go in and get an exam. They just went in to get the prescription. And, you know, th- inevitably that was uh, ended up being really bad for a lot of people. Well, you know, I just had a, a, a client uh, just retire and he decided he's going to take a golf. So I said, great, I'll take you out. We'll go out and play. And he goes, no, no, I'm going to go to the range. I'm going to practice. I'm going to groove my game before, you know, I'm going to get in front of you and embarrass myself. And I said, well, you're going to work with a pro, right? He says, no, no, I'm going to go out and just, you know, work on it. I'm, I'm you know, I'm really a diligent person. I'm a hard worker. I said, well, all you're going to do is go out and groove a bad swing. You know, whatever's wrong, you know, you're going to do it over and over again. And then you're going to embed it, you know, in, into your golf strategy. And you're never going to get better. You're not going to enjoy it. And same thing happens with investing. It's like, oh, I don't need anybody's help. I can read the Wall Street Journal. I can Google information. Um, and, you know, because you don't know what you don't know. And I think there's a lot of, um, you know, similarities when it comes to, you know, not just your portfolio strategy, but just, you know, planning in general. Well, I also think, Maybe you can get away with some of that when the stinks aren't as high. Maybe when you just started, you know, working, you're putting money in your 401k and you haven't built up the huge net worth yet. But if you've had a big liquidity event from selling your business, or now you're what you call that financial red zone where you're like 10 years away from retirement, or maybe you're retired now, it's like you just can't afford to make the same mistakes. And it's always the things that you don't know that get you, right? We only know what we know. And, you know, it always goes back to that. I almost don't like to use this analogy, but it's like Tiger Woods as a coach, mm-hmm. right? So I, I think it is conceptually kind of the same thing is you don't know what your blind spots are. And, you know, take professionals like us and Chris is arguably a professional. I don't know if we can use that term for Chris, yeah, but maybe. you know, the, the point is we're always thinking about what can go wrong because at, at the end of the day, markets do go up over time. If you can keep people invested, you know, but the problem is there's so many pitfalls along the way and a lot of pitfalls that you're probably not thinking about. And literally that's probably like 80, 90% of our job is just thinking about how can this get screwed up? You know, I think that's the key guys, right? It's the 90% is just about showing up. So being accountable, you know, do a trainer, you know, making you go to the gym when you don't want to do it. when there's a million other things you'd rather do, you know, than put yourself through that pain and suffering. (laughs) Same thing with your financial plan, doing the little things, making sure you, you make that 401k contribution, making sure that you do those tax loss swaps at the end of the year, making sure you do the RMD correctly, right? Or you claim your social security properly. There's a lot of little things that man up to a huge amount of money in your lifetime. Um, You need to be accountable to making those decisions because I think most of us are natural procrastinators, whether it comes to the gym or it comes to our financial plan. So don't be a procrastinator, be a doer, get it done. Hire an accountant, hire a, a trainer, hire a C, CFP. It's the only thing that you have to do. It's that simple. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, I got a good one for you today. The number of people on the planet has increased from 100 million people to 8 billion in the last 2,000 years and has increased from 1 billion to 8 billion in just the past 200 years. However, in China, it's not the same. In 2022, there were just 956,000 births in China, the lowest on record. That's down 50% from 10 years ago. So populations are growing. It's just not in China. Are you talking about the largest nursing home in the world, China, right? The population's aging. Um, They're not replacing it with new births. I mean, they've got a big problem there. But fortunately, India is growing dramatically. They've now exceeded China in terms of global population. And of course, you guys know one of my theses on why the markets go up over long term is there's more people. When I started this industry, there were four and a half billion people on the planet. Now there's eight billion. And surprise, surprise, earnings, profits, the economies are globally have grown. More people, more business. Let's keep it going. Let's get that birth rate up even higher. Yeah, it's like it's kind of simple. It's right. Well, it's 8 billion people that can drink Coca-Cola today versus, you know, only a billion 200 years ago. 
So <laughs> there you That's go. Right, guys. And hey, look, yeah. all we have to do is 8 billion financial plans in the next year, and we'll hit our goal. Hey, I like it. Chris is ready. He's up for the challenge. All right, Chris, since the great financial crisis, the value of homes has increased faster than mortgage debt. As a result, on average, homeowners own 71% of their homes, up from just 45% in Q1 of 2012. That's a remarkable jump. Yeah, that's incredible. Although I have to say, I still don't think it's a good time to buy into those uh, subprime mortgage bonds. Yeah, I think I still have scars on my back from that. <laughs> um, but just goes to show you too, going back to what we talked about earlier, about $150 trillion of net worth in the US right now. Just one of the reasons why people don't feel, maybe they feel kind of poor because of inflation, but they're certainly wealthier than they were just a decade ago. All right, Bob. Surprisingly, Eli Lilly, with its newly approved weight loss drug, has suddenly catapulted it to number nine by market value within the S&P 500 at nearly $600 billion, up from less than $100 billion just five years ago. That's not a tech company. You're starting to see a little rotation within that S&P 500. I suspect it won't be the same seven stocks over the next 10 years that dominate it like the last seven years. I know. We just did a whole segment on why you need to hire a trainer to get in shape, live longer, and feel better. But two thirds of the population is obese. So what do they do? They don't go to the gym. They get an injection. They get this magic injection. It's soon going to be a pill. So we'll have a magic pill where you don't have to work out. You can eat anything you want and you'll lose weight. I mean, no wonder they're doing so much business at Eli Lilly and Novo, you know, selling these weight loss drugs. Um, no surprise here, guys. Well, I think Nova apparently does more revenue than the whole GDP. Uh, of the country, I don't know what country is Novo in, uh, is actually do, <laughs> is actually based in. That's that's how crazy, uh, you know, the market opportunity is for for weight loss drugs. Pretty wild. Be better living through drugs. There you go. Better people through better chemistry, Chris. I always say that's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you watch any TV show or the commercial; it's always a pharmaceutical uh, <laughs> advertisement. So yeah, you know, it drives me crazy. Uh, back when I was in magazines, you had the fine print you never read, but now they say it out loud. And you're thinking, why would I ever take that drug? <laughs> oh, my God. Who wants to put themselves yeah, the through side, that? The side effects sound great. Yeah. <laughs> Yet they're still selling a lot of the, the, whatever drug it is. So it's, Hey, uh, I'm super wild. skinny, but I feel nauseous all the time. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's not how you feel, Chris. It's how you look. And you look marvelous. Yeah. All right. Well, look, great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 142, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our pad podcast, love our podcast on iTunes, please give us that five-star rating. Leave a nice comment so other people know how great we are. If you're listening to this on Spotify, you can subscribe or you're watching this on YouTube right now. You can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated of all our new content every single week. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.